Welcome back to Surviving and Thriving in Higher Education. Today is our first video with our Snurred New set. We've got the green that we might do a virtual green screen with uh, someday, not today. Today, we have a very special discussion with Professor Brent Liu from the University of Southern California. Now, Dr. Liu was actually one of my professors when I was an undergrad here, um, and he taught these very engaging classes, and I think he has some very, very interesting and important things to say regarding teaching and student life experience um, during a pandemic. Uh, so Dr. Liu, thank you uh, so much for speaking with me. I hope you're doing well. As well as it can be. I mean, I, I definitely am one of the professors that enjoy being on campus, love walking the campus, seeing the students walking around. Um, yeah. The last few times that I've seen it, I came in, it's depressing. I mean, to see an empty campus, I mean, a gorgeous campus just empty with no students is, to me, just feels like such a waste. For those uh, who are watching this video and who don't know who you are, um, would you mind giving us a short introduction about what you do at USC and who you are? Sure. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. I full-time teach and uh, I also do some research um, in terms of teaching. I'm teaching a variety of undergrad and graduate level courses. For research, um, my area of specialty is in medical imaging informatics. And so I have, a, I have about three PhD students, a few master's students and some undergrads that are doing research in my lab. My lab is uh, image processing and informatics lab here within the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Cool. So sort of on those lines, how has this pandemic that we find ourselves in affected the way that you guys perform research? Because I've talked, we've talked to professors who do a lot of sort of, um, who need sort of like lab benches and everything, um, but how has it affected your sort of setup and the way that you interact with your students? Since our lab is primarily um, more of a computer-based lab. We do most of our research and development in building computer software modules. The actual overall effect is minimal because most of the students, even before the pandemic, they were actually building their projects in their local environments. However, we do have um, servers that, that run in this on the campus that house uh, some of our research work. Uh, so if things need to get resolved and issues there, it's been very slow. So anything that we're trying to establish from a server level that's hosted at a at, at the campus, it's been challenging to get those things up and running, uh, partly because it's on campus and also partly because the IT infrastructure is a little bit slower now compared to before the pandemic. They're obviously addressing a lot of, of other issues. So getting things resolved, it take, it, it's a, instead of weeks, is now months, so to speak. So. Right, like everything IT now has to deal with sort of like those small fires, but now it's like also basically running the, the school and the, the way we teach and everything. Yeah, so now it's become more of support of online uh, systems that, that, that actually take the priority over, you know, what's actually running on campus itself. So how is, I guess, in particular to your, your graduate students then, are the expectations basically the same with the frequency of like meetings? Um, I know it's changed a little bit for us and for our lab, but for since you mentioned that most of the time it was they were already sort of developing in their own environments, um, what does it look like um, sort of the way that you interact with uh, your PhD students and your master's students compared to before? Um, I think it depends. So in the case, in my case, even though they do independent work, it used to be they were local. Uh, so they'd come in from time to time into the lab. Uh, so there's a little more accountability uh, our lab meetings now are Zoom meetings that are held. Uh, I try to keep them every two weeks, but progress tends to be a little slower uh, because some of the students actually live at home now. And so by living at home, the environment's different in terms of their productivity. So it becomes a more of a challenge for them as well. How has it been for yourself to be both teaching and, and working from, from home? Um, for me, I think the teaching, the actual teaching aspect is about the same. I think there are some conveniences in the sense that I don't have to get up and drive a specific amount of time to get into campus and I'm not constrained by traffic and when I decide I want to come in. Uh, now it's just, you know, I can prep or do stuff all the way up to like 10 minutes before class starts and then uh, begin the class. So those aspects actually are a benefit, but teaching is to me still a very 
in-person, hands-on, person-to-person thing to me. Uh, so I feel that um, the quality of uh, that, that type of interaction, that personal interaction is a little bit minimized with Zoom calls. You know, for example, if we're doing an interview, I probably much prefer it being something where we're face to face because you get to see not just uh, the verbal communication, body language, things like that. And just I think we're, we're social beings anyway to begin with. So having this kind of environment is better than nothing for sure, better than email, better than Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, but still not the same because of the fact that, you know, we still are very, we're very hands-on people. Right. Uh, at least from my, from my perspective. So I can say that my productivity may not change, but I think my impact to the student, it does change being on virtual Zoom teaching versus, you know, being in person. Right. On those lines, um, how what are, I guess what are some ways that you have tips or tricks that you would think like students should um, pick up, especially considering that USC um, and I get I would assume many other uh, colleges for the next semester are still very cautious with reopening and still looking at a mostly virtual semester. Although we all hope we can come back in person to some extent, um, what are ways that uh, that you have found useful in sort of bridging that gap that uh, that that sort of in-person interaction gap um, both from yourself and for the students uh that's a very challenging question because um we are limited by the technology that we're using the platform uh, so the best things we can do is request the students turn their cameras on so we can see them see their faces so at least when you're um, teaching and maybe make a joke or something, you can see their the smiles uh, on their faces so that they actually get it, they're interacting. I think um, making sure that students respond to questions uh, is important. Uh, I generally teach that way anyway in person, but some professors maybe do a lot more lecturing than actually having response from the student. So I think um, adding, um, you know, responses for students to actually respond back is important. I think even casual banter and chatting on events or, or just having a converse, general conversation that's not related to the lecture material is important just to kind of get the students at ease, you know, in an environment knowing that, you know, and giving them opportunity to, to speak up. What I've been doing recently, because I know that we're in the middle of a semester and I think they're stressed, they're, they're getting stressed out is to check on them, see how they're doing, um, and give them a, a chance to vent if they're frustrated. Generally, they may not be complaining about your class, but they might be complaining about another class, right? So at least it gives them an opportunity to kind of vent in general um, if things are stressed out um, and, and let them kind of just have that platform to do that. Sometimes it, it's funny, sometimes they'll interact in the chat window and that's fine. That's better than nothing, but it's probably much better if, you know, you can hear their voice. And, you know, a lot of students, when they're not, they're not very social to begin with, will probably find it very easy to hide behind the camera and not chat and do anything. And they'll probably be happy doing being that way. Um, but I think the ones that need the personal communication, they probably tend to suffer a little bit more because that's something that... And the other thing I kind of do is open it up to allow them to meet with me if they want anytime. So instead of having strict office hours, you know, if you need to talk to me at a specific time, that's not the typical office hours. I welcome that and let them, let them take that option. Not, not very many students actually do that still. So uh, we'll see, you know. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree. I've had a, the, the class, I'm teaching for a, for a class right now and I've had sort of the, the class Slack open. Um, and it's like, it depends on the students, but I've gotten a lot of sort of this like, you know, 10 p.m. day before things are due, questions about like homework and stuff. Um, but I think it, you're right, it does help with a lot of the sort of the social um, isolation a little bit when that happens. Mm -hmm. And I had a similar, we, we were talking about like text chat, but I had a, I just finished TAing a class um, and there was sort of the end, people were just talking about, there was a term like couch potato use in sort of the, uh, in one of the lab manuals. Uh -huh. and someone said like, aren't we all couch potatoes? And I was like, yes, I'm growing. I'm a growing potato. And so it's like, there are little things there that I think you're right. Like when you give students a little bit of those opportunities to not just focus on the 
uh, the lecture itself, but also to focus on one another and sort of how everyone's doing to sort of facilitate that a little bit. Um, but on that sort of note, I guess, are there any you know, fun experiences or stories or unique things that have happened during this pandemic, whether um, involving just sort of yourself in teaching or whether involving um, students that are, um, I don't know, like basically like quarantine stories, what, what's happened since? Uh, you know, that I saw that question. I'm like, you know, that one's going to be a tough one to answer. I think um, I haven't had or encountered anything. If anything, the Freshman Academy online is very interesting because it's normally not like that. You know, usually it's an in-class thing. And I think that even then, I mean, we really can't beat around the bush and say there are there's positive things that go on. I think, honestly, this is just not the, the method for a large institution for entering freshmen to have their first year. I mean, they're, they're, they are going to suffer. You know, they don't get the chance to build those relationships in their first year. And they're going to be basically spending the rest of their career kind of catching up, so to speak. Uh, so you may wind up seeing some that decide they want to go f five years instead of four. Uh, just because of that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be a popular wave of that for this incoming group that's coming in that, that decide they want to do a fifth year just just because or even a gap year or something. So unfortunately, I don't, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, don't, I haven't had any interesting or positive stories other than um, just being able to to chat with people uh, in these kind of meetings, like over homework and stuff like that. Maybe even they may feel less intimidated being on a Zoom call as opposed to actually seeing a professor in person. Yeah, any, any of those like crazy emails? Like I, I, I've gotten them where just like, I, I, I would just read the email and I'm like, it, how, how, do you, how do you still have this question? <laughs> Well, one person just basically wanted to give me her feedback as to how she felt she did on the test. And, you know, she, she, she explained to me that, uh, you know, um, she felt like she could, she didn't represent herself well on the, on the midterm in terms of her score. I told her, I said, that's okay. You know, you actually, believe it or not, you're doing pretty good. Uh, compared to the rest of the class. So, you know, there's really no need to worry about it. I mean, what really matters is if you're enjoying the class and you're getting a lot out of the content, that's the most important thing, right? And I think you know me from teaching 413, that's always been my philosophy, is try to learn, you know, and then the grades will come whether or not, you know, uh, and, you know, it. The, the priority is to learn, not to get an A, right? So. Well, I guess with that, um, kind of just to wrap that up, but you know, you teach freshmen, you teach upper upper division sort of undergrad class and you teach graduate students. Um, but what are some, do you have any sort of general tips or like how do you think students should be approaching this next semester? Whether they, whether it's going to be an online semester or whether it's going to be a hybrid semester, like how do you think uh, students should approach, I guess, learning in I guess, the next in the near future? So, and I think we're, your main question is directed towards grad students, right? Mainly, but I feel like some tips can be applied in general too. Um, I would say uh, for grad students, the number one thing is to try to develop a good way to push yourself. So independent study, everything's moving so slowly and you have less contact with your PI or professor. Um, and less interaction with people. Even though you think you can get a lot done, you actually wind up not getting a lot done. And various factors. Some is uh, your own desire, your own pushing yourself, and then you're not getting any external pushing as much as you normally would. That's natural human tendency, right? If you come in every day and see your PI, then you will feel the natural urge to be productive. Uh, nowadays, uh, if you're at home, especially especially if you're at home, the biggest challenge is to maintain productivity because you got so many distractions at home to do. Even though you have nothing to do, you can still find ways to distract yourself. So the number one tip I would say is to develop a really good um, sense of uh, self-motivation and independence. And you have to find some way to motivate yourself, uh, whether it's to set concrete goals that this is what I want to do in the next couple of days, uh, and, and, and finish that or um, have someone keep you accountable, something, uh, because it's easy to just kind of fall into a rut and then that rut slows you down 
and then the product productivity drops. Even if you're taking classes, especially for grad students that are doing research and don't have classes, it's really difficult because although you have all that time, you're not necessarily directing that time in the proper manner. And the normal things that you get on a day-to-day -day basis when you're a grad student on campus are not there now to kind of push you along. So you have to find those motivations, yeah. One way is to live locally near USC and try to get into the labs from time to time, which you're doing. Um, another way is to your PI to meet with you on a regular basis. Uh, a lot of times the PA, PI might be busy or your advisor might be busy. So you have to reach out to them and say, can I meet with you? I want to let you know what things are. It's, just, it's very easy to just say, well, he's not asking me to meet. So, you know, push it off and, and then eventually the gap widens to two, three or four weeks at a time. And then one day he'll, he or she will surprise you and say, hey, I want to meet with you. And then you're caught off guard because you haven't been kind of doing your own you know, thing. So if one of the ways to kind of get you to be self-motivated is to insist on meeting with your PI on a weekly basis or a, uh, you know, two week basis, then do that. Have that as your, your, your kind of your guide to do that. So I don't know, this, does that help? Yeah. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. Okay. Good thoughts, yeah. And yeah, I think that we are one of the few states that are still this way, whether for safety's issue or not. I totally understand that. I, I'm also definitely on the older age of the spectrum and I don't want to be exposed to the younger folks that are, you know, you guys are the great germ spreaders right now. I mean, especially if you're all congregated together, right? You're invincible. You know, you are, you're at that age where you're definitely invincible. Um, so I think there's a lot of fear of, of that, you know, being exposed to that, but I think it's worth the risk. I mean, if I take care of myself, which I've been doing anyway, oh, it's funny, all my graduate students during the middle of the semester get sick and I laugh. I'm like, I haven't been sick for like five years, six, seven years. And it's very simple what I do, you know, just to protect myself. And I know this uh, virus is a little bit more contagious than that, but I think it's not as what we thought it was. And yet some people are still feeling like that's the way it is. And it's unfortunate. And California is unfortunately one of those states that feels that way. So we can't do anything about it. We just have to accept it, right? Yeah. To make the best of what we have. Yeah. But that's, a, that's a great perspective. Well, thank you for taking time with me. Um, I welcome. don't want to keep you any further, but uh, I do hope to see you in person soon. Oh yeah, that'd be great. We'll be around. All right. Awesome. Take care, friend. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, go ahead and give us a like. If you disliked it, go ahead and give us a dislike. It's fine, don't worry. Comment below about how you're dealing with the pandemic and if you know anyone that maybe we should talk to about this series. Hit the subscribe button to see our future content and to be notified of that. And check out some of our other videos that are going to be populated somewhere around here. Um, thank you again so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.